Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of the Cash Flow Debates. My name is Eddie Hood. I am one of the hosts of this show, and I have my two other uh, esteemed companions here. This is Dan Luthi and Ryan Steck. Uh, they're the best accountants I've ever met in my life, and that's saying a lot because I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but because this is the first show ever, I thought we would take just a second to explain who we are and why we're here, and then we'll get into today's topic, which is on the idea of niching. I think niching can be a very scary thing, a very exciting thing, but there are also some financial implications that people don't often consider, and I wanted to just sort of get into that. Uh, I also want to explain why we chose the name Cash Flow Debates. That makes the show a little unique, uh, but before we do, let's explain who we are. So. I often say that Dan is our operational wizard at IgniteSpot. He spends a lot of time thinking about processes and workflows. He is often called the software whisperer or guru. So, Dan, tell us who you are. Uh, thanks, Eddie. Um, yep, my name is Dan Luthi. I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about systems and processes and how that affects a business uh, as you're growing it and as you're trying to move through it. Uh, spent a lot of time working in that, not only with our own organization, but thousands of clients as well over the years. Um, and a big part of that too is also connecting with our software partners we work with. And so got a lot of opportunity to give direct feedback to them and work with them um, on a regular reoccurring basis, which helps to make sure the product meets the actual needs of our clients, but also make sure it actually works for our <laughs> systems and processes that we're trying to build. That, that's, uh, that's a hard thing to do because when you have an entrepreneur who's really excited about doing crazy stuff, like you have to sort of bolt things together, right? So you've been like, what systems have you been in? You've been in like hundreds of point of sale systems, inventory systems, accounting platforms. Yeah, really anything you can think of operationally for an organization we've touched at some point in time, whether it's CRMs all the way to invoicing processes, yeah. um, all the way down to the manufacturing systems and workflows that go through. I mean, really, it's about making sure that the organization is working from A to Z, from the inception of the idea all the way to the delivery to the consumer. Um, and so whether that's service or, to, you know, product based. And so uh, we really dive into all of that and really focus on trying to be able to make sure that it works for their organization, not against their organizational goals. So, and you have uh, you have a master's degree in accounting? Yep, I got an undergrad from the University of Utah and a master's degree from Southern Utah University. Yep. Uh, it's early people, yeah, we don't definitely. have to speak clearly at this point. <laughs> so, we can slur our words. It's always early, that's yep. why we bring extra drinks to yep. be able to cover that. Okay, and so you have that behind you and then um, you've also got some interesting designations in terms of certifications. You've been pretty high in the ranks with the QuickBooks uh, team. So talk about that. Yeah, so. definitely. So over the years, as Eddie mentioned, we've had a lot of chance to be able to partner with the software uh, companies that we work with. One of those, of course, is Intuit or QuickBooks. Back in 2019, I was chosen to be one of 11 accountants who gave them feedback on a regular basis regarding their products and services. And we've kept that conversation going over the years. Usually that's a two-year term. And uh, I've been able to work with them really over the past four and a half, five years on a regular basis, just giving them honest feedback regarding their product and what our customers need. I dove in more into payroll companies as well. I've had a partnership with uh, with Gusto as well as with Bill.com or Bill as it's known. And so, yeah, I mean, we really focus on trying to make sure that the product really meets our customer needs, spend a lot of time at conferences, getting to understand those products and connecting with our partners to really give the honest feedback. Yeah. So my, my job at Ignite Spot, we do outsourced accounting. We're all wearing our fancy Ignite Spot swag today. Uh, but my job is client acquisition. I need to do business development and bring clients in. And every conversation I have with somebody, it's always a problem with, well, how is this software going to work with this process? And I always have to revert to Dan because he, he has just an immense amount of knowledge on um, doing the behind the scenes work that honestly nobody wants to do and for whatever reason he likes doing it. So we're really grateful for that. <laughs> but uh, he's gonna be the operational voice on the show. He's going to be the one that brings that uh, sort of workflow task management uh, side of things to the debate that we have. All right, so let's move on to Ryan Steck. Uh, I met Ryan at uh, a business networking event, a chamber of commerce kind of thing, yeah. It was a good day. So Ryan, tell us who you are and why you're here. 
Sure. I'm Ryan Steck. I am a CPA and I am the head of the advisory services here at Ignite Spot. And what does that mean? That means basically we look at your controller and your CFO services and the things that actually help businesses get where they're going. I'm in charge of that department. And, and where I get excited about life is actually helping business owners achieve their goals. Yeah. Everyone goes into business for a reason, whether that's they want a lifestyle, they want to make money, they want to retire, they want to build something to sell. They're all getting into business for a reason. And my job and what I love is the ability to come in and actually help owners try and achieve those goals that they've set for themselves and not get lost in the doldrums of the, the business on a daily basis and the things where we kind of get lost in the weeds. All right. So there's a lot to be said right there. Uh, I want you guys to all pay attention to a couple of the phrases that Ryan used. First of all, he talked about uh, achieving the goals that you want and not getting lost in the weeds. So ultimately, your designation here is a CFO, mm -hmm. right? So chief financial officer is uh, what that means, of course. And a chief financial officer, in my opinion, is not one who is looking at, you know, did the guilt bills get paid on time so much as how, how is your strategy going to get you from A to B? And that's a complicated thing because there's a lot of ways to, to do that, right? So you've been doing that kind of work in consulting businesses on growth strategies for a long time. I mean, how long have you been in the industry? Over probably 23 years now. Okay. All right. And you're a CPA. Correct. Right. Which means you're super nerdy. Super nerdy. Yeah, we love that about you. Walk us through really quickly just some examples of engagements that you've coached on, um, types of clients, industries that you've worked in? Yeah, lots of different industries. And that's the exciting part about this. And, and to me, it's really not so much about the industries you work on. It's about understanding an entrepreneur's goals. We can talk about different industries and what people do, but ultimately you're going into a business because you found something you like, you found something you're good at, you found something that speaks to you. Right. Ultimately, you've got to figure out how to achieve what it is you set out to do originally. And a lot of times you'll talk to entrepreneurs two, three, five years down the road, and they're just trying to get by day by day by day. Yeah. They've lost some of that vision. They've lost some of that dream. They've lost that twinkle in their eye, if you will. And now what hey, you've got to do... Your twinkle good? My twinkle's good today. You got good. a good twinkle yeah. going. <laughs> Showing up. That's because you got your Mountain Dew. Yeah, it's definitely. twinkle juice. That's every day. All right. And your job is to come in and kind of reignite that fire, look forward with them, not look back on financials and say, how are we going to get you there? What's working for you? What isn't? Are your people working for you? Is your revenue model built correctly? Yeah. What is your marketing strategy? How's that working out for you? And it's looking forward to say, how do we get you where you actually thought you were going to be? five years ago when you started this journey. So I have often turned to Ryan in times of need for a couple of reasons. One, uh, he is the financial voice in my life. So if something needs to be forecasted or budgeted out or I get some crazy wild haired idea, I always go to Ryan and say, how do we make this work? Because there is a financial implication to everything we do. Um, and I, as the crazy entrepreneur, often don't play in the rules Ryan gives me, but he's always there to kind of rein me back in and make sure that we're getting to where we're trying to go as a team. I can honestly say that without Ryan and Dan, I, we would not be in business. We've been in here since 2008. We've been working together. I probably would have sunk the company in 2009 had it not been for these two guys. And I think that's important because... We all have different skill sets, right? I'm not an operational guy. I'm not uh, an analytical financial guy, although I do have a degree in accounting. Um, I'm just really excited about ideas. I'm really excited about changing things and vision and moving people forward and bringing energy into a room. But you need some, some intelligence behind you to do that well. So uh, that's sort of where we come from. And uh, my own personal background, I have a master's in business. I got an MBA from uh, University of Utah. I started this company in 2008 out of my living room and haven't looked back since. I have started multiple companies. I have failed at multiple companies. Um, I've seen some successes and I've seen a lot of learning experiences along the way. But uh, the energy that I hope to bring to this show is one of the entrepreneurial spirit, the idea that there's always something to be done 
and uh, it's time to grow and scale a business. And I want to do that as quickly as possible. They want to do it as intelligently as possible. So it's a nice balance. So that leads into the point of the show, right? The cash flow debates. And how did we come up with that title? So Dan, like what what was our thinking when we came up with that? Yeah, I think the the biggest part of it is, is we knew we were not always going to agree. Uh, 100% on the decisions and direction we were going uh, or the the topic for the, the session. So debates was really easy on that piece. Um, we fight a lot. Yeah, fight or have positive arguments. <laughs> I, I'm not sure which one it is. It's but, good though. Yeah, but then the other part of it too is, is as, as business owners, our biggest focus is making sure that we're profitable and making sure our clients are profitable. And so yeah. cash flow is a critical part of that. It's something that all three of us think about very heavily when it comes to the roles that we play in our organization and work with our clients. And so cash flow debates kind of just worked really well together based off of uh, our intent and based off of kind of how we think and, and work as, as partners. We wanted to create a, a podcast show that mimics our daily life together because we get into a room and there's always a topic every day that we're trying to work through either for a client or for ourselves. And because we have a financial brain, an operational brain, and an entrepreneurial brain, there's always a point of conflict. But conflict isn't the right word. Like we don't, we don't fight, like you said, but we definitely get under each other's skin at times. And, and then we walk away realizing, oh, there was actually a lot of value in what that person said. And we always come back and we're better for it, right? For sure. I think that's the point of the debate. Ryan's always the middle guy, though. It's usually me and Dan kind of going at each other. Sales and operations really do yeah. not always love playing together, so that no. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he's always in my sandbox, and it drives me nuts, but but I'm glad he's there. Ryan's usually in the middle, though, is sort of that sage uh, wisdom, just listen <laughs> and uh, calm us both down. So that is the reason for the name Cash Flow Debates. To start this week's show, our very first episode ever, I'm excited to share with you the fact that we are struggling with this concept ourselves. And I think as business owners, it's okay to not be perfect at everything and to not feel like you have it all figured out because we've been doing business for a long time, right? We've been working together for a long time. We have coached hundreds of businesses across the country in every industry, and we're still figuring it out, right? We don't have all of the answers, but we do have is a lot of experience, a lot of opportunities to have looked under financial hoods of companies and say, oh, wow, that, that really isn't working very well, or this is working. So our, our job is to bring that information to you. Of course, we'll keep our clients' identities protected. We're not going to share who's making what money, but we will share with you what people are doing and whether it's working or not. And I hope that you find that valuable. Is that fair, Ryan? Very fair. Yeah, that's what we're doing. And I think the financial aspect is what makes this show unique, right? Because as the CFO... We can speak directly to the profit margins we're seeing, how an entrepreneur's decisions are affecting their ability to actually build real wealth. Well, let's jump into today's topic. So we are talking about niching, and this gets under our skin a little bit because we have been debating about this topic for years. And there's an ongoing um, sort of joke between the three of us that we are, were supposed to be the accountants for dentists many, many years ago. <laughs> Uh, of our favorite place to go, right? So we I, all want to be that person. I'm actually quite terrified of dentists. It is one of my biggest fears, that and sharks. We started this firm and we decided in the beginning to be a general firm, right? Uh, meaning that we just took all clients from all walks of life. And we're going to get into today how that actually has helped us at times and has hurt us at times and what we're doing about it now to try and learn uh, from those lessons. But the first question I wanted to ask you guys, and I'm just going to ping it off of both of you, and then I might uh, push back a little. But the first question is, is why do most entrepreneurs, including us, fear niching a business? So Ryan, what do you think? I think because you take the population of people you can work for, and you shrink it down to a very small number. And so you, you look at it from a marketing and sales strategy and say, it, as a business owner, I'm now going to take the pool of people I can talk to and I'm going to really just slash it way down. That's that's a scary thought for a lot of business owners. Yeah, it's terrifying. It makes you it makes you think cuz getting customers is that's not an easy feat regardless, right? Like it can be confusing. To, do I spend my money on uh, you know Facebook ads? Do we do PPC? Do we do a referral program? It's a lot of work to even get one customer and so to shrink that down seems like a bad idea. I think that's the, a lot of the times when you first start into it, you're really 
you're focused on the passion. Ryan talked about this in the beginning of the passion of what you want to do and what you're trying to accomplish with it. And so it kind of scares the crap out of you to say, well, I'm not going to work with these types of clients, even though they may want the services or the offerings that I have. I really don't want to work with them potentially because it doesn't allow me to be as consistent as I want to be. There's a saying that, uh, that I always laugh at. It's called, uh, there's riches in the niches. Uh, I think it's true in a lot of cases, but it's also really scary to be able to dive down that road because it also requires you to be truly an expert at the processes and the things that you do too. And I think that's scary for a lot of people of being the, you know, being the only person or being the best person in that space. We all want to be the best, but to actually be perceived as the best, that's a very different feeling. And that's a very different expectation you have to maintain. It's commitment issues. Sometimes, yeah. It's commitment yeah. issues. <laughs> well, you mentioned that we you have to be an expert at something, right? Like if we're going to pick an industry ourselves as accountants, let's say we wanted to do this for car dealers or something. I mean, I don't know anything about car dealerships personally. I haven't worked on it. Maybe I think you guys have done some work on it, but I haven't. Um, the idea of niching our firm down to do just car dealerships terrifies me because I'm going to have to go to their conferences. I'm going to have to like learn their software platforms. I'm going to have to learn how they talk, walk, dress, and think, right? Uh, in order to actually be the accounting firm for these car dealers. That just feels like a lot of work. And I'm already working a lot, right? So where am I going to fit all that time in? I think it is 100% a lot of work. I think the biggest part with it too is you have to know exactly what the market's changing with in those conversations as well. Your your customer base always has a demand change. And so even if you were perfect at something and amazing at it, you have to adjust those. You talk about cars. I mean, we've seen a massive amount of change in the market over the last three years, four years. Well, you need to be able to adapt and maintain your coaching ability and your process abilities as you're going through that as well. And that just changes the entire game. And so you still have variability in being that expert, but it's something you have to maintain. It just doesn't happen overnight and you can't just keep it forever as that one person that just does really, really well at one thing. Ryan, you're kind of our news guy, right? You're like, I feel like Ryan just has like a ticker symbol running through his brain at all times. I don't know. But he always knows what's happening in the economy. And we go to breakfast every Friday and he always gives us the update on (laughs) what's happening with the world, which I appreciate because I don't watch the news. But um, Dan said something that I think triggers uh, us a little bit. And you, you bring it up, which is if we pick a specific industry, well, that industry might get slammed tomorrow. If something in the economy causes car dealerships to, there's a weird tariff or something, I don't know. Now that affects you as the niche player. What do you think about that? Even goes a step beyond that in saying, yes, something could hit an industry if you're niching it. Yeah. But what if that industry goes away? Right. I mean, when you're sitting. That feels scary. That feels scary. Gamble? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about car dealerships. I mean. Let's say for whatever reason, the electric vehicle market really does what it's supposed to do. How would you like to be a mechanic working on combustion engines right now, knowing that in 10 years, there's just electric vehicles on the road? I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but how would you feel in that circumstance? And when you niche, you're going all in on something and you're going in on the idea of what it is, the industry itself, the product, whatever it is, you're going all in and You're an expert. That's why people go to you. Yeah. But if something happens to that industry, not just in that, oh, economically something's happened into that industry, but through innovation or something else, if something changes, that is so scary. I'm going to sort of be the devil's advocate for just a minute here. Now, I think the argument is that, uh, yeah, you could lose everything by rolling your dice on this industry. But the idea is that if you really go all in, you're making some contacts in that industry, some probably high up contacts if you're the best of the best. You're making a brand for yourself. You're becoming known as the go-to girl or the go-to guy for that service, right? If the industry does go under, all of those people will probably need help and guidance and they'll probably turn to you as the solution for that, which is only going to create more opportunity, I would think. And if you're really good at a specific skill set, you're probably also good at pivoting, right? You'll probably see that electric car problem coming because you're reading the newspaper articles, you're in the journals, you're, you're going to the conferences, you know it's coming. And if you're going to be the best of the best, that means you're probably getting ready for that shift anyway, right? And that way you'll be 10 steps ahead of every other accountant who's kind of good at car dealerships. I think to that same point, though, from the from the process side of it, sometimes it's, you have to be careful that you're not 
too early mm -hmm. in, in a specific market or things to that nature. I mean, 10 years ago or 12 years ago when we really started shifting things to the cloud as an accounting firm, we got, we got a lot of kickback yeah. from our clients by doing that. There was a lot of frustration. Um, the products weren't as good. Can we hit pause for a minute? That's how old we are. Yeah. You just said when we shifted to the cloud. <laughs> We used to do everything on paper and we had to drive to all of our clients' offices because yeah. we started in 2008 before all this tech was out. Yeah, definitely. No, but it's it's a great point. But I think that's the big thing is it was it was fearful. People weren't comfortable with that kind of transition. And it was something that we had to leverage at the time to put an extra effort and energy to be able to keep people up on it, which required a lot of learning and a knowledge regarding what was going on with the transition to the cloud. Now it's expected. Um, COVID really changed everything in my opinion, astronomically when it came to workflows and softwares and businesses that run online. And we've seen a massive tech boom because of that and a lot of really big changes in how platforms are run. But it was fearful for a lot of people, fearful for people to be able to go through it. But I think that's a part of it as well that's critical is when you get ahead of something, it gives you an opportunity to be able to become truly an expert at what you do. And I think now, 10 plus years later, as we look back at this, we're really grateful we started early because we could work out some of those bugs and issues when the market was transitioning and it wasn't as 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 a massive problem for us to be able to get through. And it makes it a lot easier for us to specialize and be a good quality client provider, service provider. I think that's in response to the first question, why is it so fearful? I think we've addressed the fact that it's it feels it feels like a bit of a gamble, like you're you're shortening the site on your your market, your opportunity. I don't know that that's really the case. I think that's just the fear that we have. Because when you look at it, there's a lot of car dealerships out there. I don't want to do car dealerships, guys, by the way. But I'm just saying there's a lot of them. The argument, of course, is that the marketing message is going to convert far more people because it's specific to them and their need, right? So I think marketing actually becomes cheaper when you niche, uh, even though there are fewer people to speak to. Your message has a bigger impact. Uh, I, I mean, again, me being in charge of the marketing and sales over here, anytime we come up with a niched conversation at all, our conversion rate goes way up, way up. Um, but anytime we're just, hey, we do bookkeeping and accounting for people, it's like buying corn in the grocery store. Like people just look for the cheapest version of corn and they buy that. They don't consider us as a special thing, right? Well, let's jump into the next idea here. What are the benefits of being a generalist? Right. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on how have we benefited from not niching up to this point? And I say up to this point. So cliffhanger, hang out till the rest to the end of the episode to see kind of what we're doing to niche our business a little more because I'm excited about it. But up to this point, we've been very general. Uh, how has that benefited us? You can really help a lot of people. Yeah. And we look at our systems and our processes. That's a world that Dan lives heavily in. And we look at the things we do. And really, for most industries, there's not a great deal of expertise that is needed to actually be industry specific and still do a good job for a client. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to take all of the things we've created and done, and we can actually replicate that across many different industries because we've put in the correct systems, the right people, the right training, and we simplified things in how we do things so that we can be generalists. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of flexibility in being generalist, I think. And what I mean by flexibility is uh, when clients come up with new problems or issues, a lot of times those things that they're running into, you know how to work on them because you've touched it or you've worked on something similar to that in the past. And so that's really convenient. But to Ryan's point, too, from the technology standpoint, when you're working on a business Money comes in, money goes out. You can set up processes and systems and, you know, workflows that allow you to be able to make sure that those are taking the necessities being taken care of. Doesn't mean you may have the best expertise on what CRM you should run for that type of business or project management tool. Potentially not. You may have to figure out those other kind of pieces, but generally you have most of the flex and control over the the core root of what keeps that business moving forward. Yeah. For us, I think being a generalist actually was a good thing. We started this firm in the housing recession when everything was just falling apart. And so being a generalist allowed us to pick up clientele as we could. But then when COVID hit, we had probably 15% of our business just fall away because people were going out of business. COVID just knocked them out. And I think, man, if we had specialized in any of those industries, what would we, what would we be doing right now? Uh, so that helped us. We didn't have all of our eggs in one basket. 
I think that's nice. But like I said, there are pros and cons to both, right? As a niched business, you have cheaper marketing, more targeted marketing, and you can be a, you can be an expert. You can charge more for your services. Uh, but as a generalist, you can weather some of the economic craziness a little easier. But it is harder to get customers. I got to be honest. You know, we're working on our rear ends off to get customers, and it's hard to get noticed when you're not a specialist in something. So. Well, and I, I think to add to that too, I mean, it's probably mainly because the everybody's now doing a lot of these things. Yeah. COVID allowed for a lot of accountants to be able to create new firms that are very small and quick. And so now the market went from 10 fractional accounting service organizations, you know, 10 plus years ago to now there's thousands of them. And so you put a name on a web on Google, the search changes. So it becomes also a lot more expensive to be able to find clients and be on page one. Yeah, I like it. Okay, let's talk money. Money is always interesting to accountants. We like to track money and make more of it. So let's talk about the financial implications behind a niching or not. So as you guys have been coaching businesses throughout your career, uh, take a second to think about specific businesses. Don't share their names, of course, but think about businesses that are highly niched that you've coached, right? Ones that are like super focused on a specific skill set or offering. What have been the financial implications of their decisions and how they run their businesses? Yeah, I think for me, when I look at that, what I see is that they have very focused investment, okay. meaning if you look at applications they might build, if you look at the output and the products that they design, everything is very, very focused and they understand exactly what it is they're trying to build and they understand exactly who their audience is. So when they take that money and invest it in something, there's a real purpose and an end goal to what they're actually creating. So you can move faster as a niche business then because you're not like just throwing darts at a board to see what sticks and be like, I don't know, let's try this software this week, see if it meets our need or let's whatever. You, you're trying to solve a very specific problem, so there are specific tools to do that. You can ignore all the other stuff, right? Very much so. I mean, uh, we've some for some reason have always had really great success working with pharmacies over the years, um, and different types of pharmacies, uh, from you know in person, over, you know, with OTC in the front to mail order and things like that. But what is OTC? Over the counter. Yeah. Specifically, a client group that we worked with a couple of years ago was uh, a mail order pharmacy. And the part that was really unique about it is they really only took sold two products. They didn't sell thousands of it. They weren't compounding, you know, uh, prescriptions and things like that. They weren't kind of being everything to everybody. They really only sold two specific products. And because of that, it allowed them to be able to partner with um, specific business businesses and talk to doctors and things like that to be that single point of contact for them. And so it created a really great opportunity for them to create purchasing power based off of only providing those two specific products. It allowed them to be able to be direct uh, doctors that they were talking to about being that solution for it. But it also gave them the opportunity to be able to negotiate with insurance companies a lot differently. And so that was a great opportunity for them to be able to really provide a next level um, service with only actually providing two types of products to their consumers. And as we know, pharmacies provide, in some cases, thousands of different solutions. And so that's just a really good example of someone who took just something very, very specific and made a nationwide organization that was selling millions and millions of dollars every single month of just these two products to, to people and shipping them all over the United States. I love that. I love the idea that this business is able to sort of really hone in on what they're doing. It's something I've always wanted for us as an accounting firm to be able to just hone in, know exactly what we're doing, we go to breakfast all the time, like I say, and because we have been uh, really general in our services, we're always trying to line up the marketing message with what we're doing in-house, right? Like we need to make sure that what I'm saying on the website that the customer is going to get is what we're actually providing. That's hard because we might be working in pharmacies one day and then farm equipment the next day. And so it's like, well, what are we providing? You know, and while it is, um, you know, you can spread it across many businesses, it is nice to have a, no, we do farm equipment. This is how we do it. This is what you're going to get. So I think there's a specificity that comes with niching that really does make it easier to get that market message clear and correct very quickly. I do think one of the parts that uh, that's always unique about, uh, about niches, and this is one of the parts that I think a lot of times people don't think about so much when they go down that road, is 
once you decide that decision and go down that road, you have to actually have people who can skillfully provide that service <laughs> to those people. We got to train um, people now. You know, now, you know, that's one of the contexts that's really unique about it is, you know, it's one thing to be a generalist that because accounting is accounting is accounting, right? Well, you treat accounting differently if you're dealing with trusts. You treat accounting differently if you're dealing with nonprofits because the language and terminology is different. You can't just have someone who has a basic degree do a good job at it. And so now that we're struggling with skills and having people and not as many accountants in the market right now, um, it also is scary to be able to take that on because you actually potentially put yourself in a position where – you struggle not from acquiring clients, but you struggle from hiring talent to service those clients. And so that becomes really difficult to manage and stabilize the quality of service that you can provide to your clients because of that niched expectation. Super convenient on the sales side, but yeah. the operational piece becomes a struggle um, to be able to move through from, from that perspective as well. That's where we start to like clash a little bit. hundred percent. I want that clarity of message to say, we do farm equipment. I don't want to do farm equipment, but that as an example, right? You're making a good point though, because this getting staff is hard, um, hard enough to get somebody who's smart and intelligent and will show up to work on time. That's a challenge in itself, right? But now to get somebody who's a specialist at farm equipment, that's really hard to find. And they're going to cost more, right, Ryan? Like the salary is going to go up. So, Which means the cost of the service is going to go up, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's part of the financial implication. If we niche, we're likely going to experience higher labor costs because we have to have somebody who actually really knows what they're doing. Plus, we have to invest in them from a certification standpoint, sending the conferences for the thing and so on. There's a lot of money that goes into being a good niche provider. 100%. Not just a cool logo, right? It's... You actually have to have the staff to do the work. Yeah, and on the flip side, though, and this is where we, we always kind of fall in love with that generalist, and, and we've been talking about that, but I always look at it kind of as the YouTube effect, if you will. If you're going to run a project in your yard, are you going to go search on YouTube for a guy who's got a video on the specific project you're going to do, plus he's got 10 other videos on completely unrelated things, or are you going to find a YouTube specialist who specializes just in those type of projects? And YouTube really clarifies how niching can be really important. And I've got certain niche people on YouTube that I follow who do very specific things and do videos on very specific things. I don't follow generalists on YouTube. I follow niche people on YouTube. And that's where we get information. They're better at what they do, right? They, I don't want watered down advice. I want stuff that works, right? Somebody who's been thinking about this for a while. Well, all right. So we know the value of niching. We also know that it's expensive and it's scary, right? Because recruiting, I don't, recruiting is my least favorite part of being a business owner because it's, it's so time consuming to stop what we're doing, to go out and get, resumes to read through them to debate about who we want to hire i mean it's like a it just stops the whole system right um but i love the people that work at ignite spot i think they're the best staff we've ever had but it has been a lot of work to find those people For sure. a lot of work to find those people we love you guys if you're watching this we love you guys <laughs> but when we lose a staff member it's like getting your arm cut off because now we have to find somebody to to support the clients that they were supporting we have to there's often like an emotional hole that's left because everybody like loves everybody. So that, that is sort of exacerbated if you're a, if you're a niched company, right? That's one of the downfalls is we just lost our guru at this thing. He's the person we all went to for this high end conversation. Now we have nobody to fill that. Who's going to fill that while we're trying to, I mean, that's scary. Definitely. A lot of times you have to consume it internally throughout the rest of the team, which yeah. can put extra pressure and, and uh, difficulty in, for everybody to be able to try to get through all that as you look to find that person. And if you're specifically looking for someone who has very unique sets of skills, um, you know, like Liam Neeson style, really unique sets of skills. Um, <laughs> find you. Yeah, definitely. Um, those people oftentimes are much more difficult to find. So the process of replacing them can take not just weeks, but months yeah. and potentially a year if you specialize too far. Yeah. Yeah. Because you could find the right person, but they want 400 grand a year. Or something sure. It doesn't meet your budgets. It doesn't meet your constraints you have. Yeah. 
That's, that's true. Or they're really good, but they don't have experience in the three platforms you've specialized in. Right. And so now you have, you know, the great candidate culture wise and has good understanding on some aspect of what you do, but not all of it. So right. it creates complication there too. Right. So this is like why we've been walking this divide and why we've always struggled with being niched or not, because we know the value of it. We know that it could bring higher quality uh, clientele in, although our clients are fantastic, but you know, you get the point, right? Sure. Uh, it allows us to be great at what we do that I love going to work knowing I'm good at what I do, right? All of that stuff, are the, the pros are really sort of enticing. There are some real fears like underlying this conversation and why I think a lot of people don't do it. Uh, now, we have decided to take our own unique approach to niching, and we've slowly been getting a little more niched over the years. So um, one of those things is we decided last year not so much to focus on a specific industry but to focus on a specific process right so most accountants decide to bill by the hour or they do a monthly retainer and it's kind of we'll come in we'll be your guy or your gal and we'll just we'll do your books for you and we'll sort it out but we decided to come up with a very specific package model so what's the idea behind that dan uh, the biggest part behind that was it allowed us to be able to provide a high quality product that was consistent across our customer base. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest issues, as we talked about, is inconsistency with with being a generalist. Sometimes you try to solve every pro potential problem that a client has, and sometimes you don't know the perfect answer for their unique situation. And so we making the decision to switch to a very consistent product delivery model has allowed our employees to become much more uh, advanced in their knowledge and skill set regarding those specific skills. A lot of times, and I'll use this as an example, a lot of times you find in accounting firms, the accountants will do everything from A to Z, which means they'll enter all the transactions in, they'll reconcile bank accounts, but they're also trying to consult on financials and have discussions regarding high level, this is what you need to do, and, and advice and advisory based functions. And we found that that really wasn't something that was working well for our customers. Our customers weren't feeling satisfied with the quality of product we were providing or that is available in the market because those people really weren't specific with what they were trying to do. And so that's made a big change for us over the last two years really as we've gone through this is really shifting the mindset of our staff, but also shifting the mindset of our clients to expect a very specific set of deliverables and a very specific set of services from us. Okay, so I want to get to Ryan on this in a second. If you're a service-based business and you don't really know a specific industry you want to serve, we went through and said, well, we're only going to provide these services now for what we do. So we got very specific about how we do what we do. So we created four packages. There's a bookkeeper, an accountant package, a controller package, and a CFO package. And within each one of those packages, it lists what we will do and what we won't do, right? And that has been pretty helpful for us strategically. Yeah. What it's done is it it allows us to get out of the weeds ourselves and it allows the clients to get out of the weeds a little bit because we do tend to get distracted. We too t tend to get excited about things that necessarily don't have a lot of impact on our companies. And so what we've done is we've come in and we've built systems and product models that we feel really address what the clients are looking for. In doing so, I think we take out a lot of the distractions that they create for themselves, that we create for them, so that we can come in and be more focused in giving them something that makes sense, is well thought out, and will actually help them succeed in business. It is so funny if we look over the years how many times we've talked to business owners who just get wrapped up in things that don't matter, and all of a sudden we're doing this big, long project. They're spending time talking for hours about something that really has no material impact on how they're going to succeed or fail as a business. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's made us better at what we do. We used to have a system that was like, we would hire smart people and then we would give them clients and say, good luck, yeah. <laughs> figure it out. We'll pay you your wage and hopefully things go okay. Ever since we put the four product model into place, uh, you can go to our website at ignitespot.com. If you click on pricing or whatever, you'll see our four packages there as an example for your own service-based business. That has changed how we manage our staff too, because now we have something to manage them too. Again, before it was just trust, but now we can go through their workload and make sure that they're actually providing these four products. Well, and I'll say to that same point too, from an operational standpoint, when you make a change to the process organizationally, it changes every client. Yeah. And so from a management standpoint, 
employees aren't trying to learn 10,000 different changes. They're not trying to um, learn different software applications and different things of that nature that are very complex or individual by each into business type. It allows to have a really unique set of training that doesn't overwhelm them as a part of their workflow process as well. And so that's another thing we've tried to do over the last couple of years as well, really, um, and focus on making sure our education is meaningful for our team that applies to the services they're delivering, not just, hey, here's some great update and what's happening in the market. Hope you like it. And let's see if you can do really good at it. No, we've really taken the energy and effort to say, this is the tools we're using. These are the resources we're using. This is the communication pattern we want to have with our clients. Here's how you're going to do it. And here's how you can be successful in the process with it as well. And I think that gives a lot of, uh, it gives a lot of hope to a new employee. It gives a lot of hope to a team that everybody else that's on their team is working in the same type of workflow as them. And their problems are, you know, each problem they have is the same problems everybody else on the team is having. We have definitely saved money on labor costs because of the product package. We've saved time. But I like it as the marketing guy, too, because people are always on the on the phone with me saying, what am I going to get if I hire you? And I can say, here are the four packages. Pick one that makes sense. It used to take us days to create a proposal for a client, right? Days, because we would have to go through and build this custom thing and do custom calculations and make sure we weren't losing our shorts on the on the deal. And now it takes us about 45 seconds to make a proposal. They tell us what package they want. We put in their revenue because we bill our clients now as a percentage of their revenue. The thing spits it out, we email it off and we're done. And it's so much more efficient. They know what they're getting, we know what we're providing. It's a nice way to niche if you're if you're scared of like just grabbing onto an industry and complete, right? Very just get very so. specific about what you do. That's a form of niching and it works really well. Right. Very much so. It's still a generous approach, like you sure. mentioned before. Um, and so there are going to be some limitations you have with your customers in that space, maybe some expectations that they would love you to do. Yeah. Um, but you get that opportunity to be able to clarify. And I think Ryan hit the nail on the head with this earlier, which is the customers start to change their expectation to the expectation of what your delivery is. And they start to trust more in the level of service you provide. And so that opens up a lot of doors for cleaner discussion. It opens a lot of doors for consistency and also helps you to a client to find out faster if you're the right fit for them, because maybe they really do need something that's custom that you don't have the skill set to do. Well, we recently started having a conversation about our business. And the nice thing about being a generalist, we learn over the years what we are good at and what we're not so good at. So, uh, and both of you feel free to answer this, but what are some of the industries we're really good at? What are some of the industries we're not so good at? Yeah, I, I'd say for us, anything service-based, we've always done very well at. That's something we do quite well. Mm -hmm. um, where we don't do well and where we stay away, I hate construction, construction and we hate construction. <laughs> we don't touch it. If you're a construction client, sorry, we're not a good fit for you. <laughs> Yeah, construction is a tough one. And I and I think to clarify on why we don't like construction, because I think that's good for people to understand, is there's so many different types of construction. There's short-term, long-term projects. There's stuff that gets government grants, things you have to hit sort of styles of it. It's really hard to find a very qualified accountant who understands all of those specific things. And oftentimes, also construction companies are moving so quickly that they need information every single day. And our service has never been built to respond to a client every single day. It's, it's not a real-time service. Correct. We're based more on a weekly, semi-monthly type-based offering, and that that creates limitations for a construction company to be able to get what they want. Also, too, construction margins are really, really low, and so they're always scripting and saving, and it becomes really difficult also to try to manage that when you're so far behind in the process. And it's not saying that we're not trying to be proactive in that space. It's just not the way that our structure has been built over the years, and so it's been really difficult to service. We're sharing this with you because I'm hoping that it will inspire you as an entrepreneur to look at your own industries and really have an honest look at what you're good at and what you're not good at. Because if you just say yes to everything, you're going to go out of business. We've seen that in our clients. We have clients that say yes to everything and they don't last very long. Uh, we have learned that there are certain softwares we're not good at. There are certain industries we're not good at. And we're very happy to say we're not good at that. <laughs> Please go somewhere else. But construction is not really built for the outsourced industry, I don't think. There are so many people out in the field digging ditches, and then they go to Home Depot, and they buy stuff for a job, and they buy a bell of wire, and some of it gets used on this job, and some of it gets used on that job. And the business owner, the entrepreneur, wants to know how profitable is job A to job B. Well, 
But the guy out there digging ditches doesn't want to take time to separate out his receipts and and itemize everything and get it to us and what have you. And there's a lot of like physical paper in construction, a lot of it, because it's an old school industry still. I think it is. You know, it's not as digitally advanced as others are. There's just a lot of paper invoices flying around there. Well, and I think the other thing with it too is construction generally is they're generalists too. Yeah. And so when they're generalists, they don't know what their sales margins are going to be on a plumbing job versus a home renovation versus a, you know, a tile job. Like it's so different for them in that perspective. And so going back to that qualification regarding margins and information and content, like you can't delay in it because you have to be up to date on each of those to make sure that when they price the next job, it's accurate. Um, and so there's so many different types of service offerings and consistencies in there. It usually requires someone who can put higher level of detail into it. And then also too, I mean, construction companies are running constantly and rampant and accounting is usually the last thing they think about, um, except for when they're trying to determine what their profitability is. Like that's So that makes it also difficult for our relationship and how we provide service, which is a, more of a higher touch. Here's one of the nice things about being a generalist. Like I mentioned, you get to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. And so this leads into our sort of next evolution for niching here at Ignite Spot, which I'll get into in just a minute. But we had a conversation a while ago. Dan was out in um, on at a conference or something, and Ryan and I went to breakfast, and we were talking about, well, what are we good at? What are the industries we've always done well at? And we went through several, but one of them came up in particular that made a whole lot of sense for us. What was that industry, Ryan? Yeah, that was the daycare industry. Um, It's a service-based industry. It's something we have a lot of experience in. And honestly, given the market and the economy, we have a lot of parents who have to work two jobs. There's a big demand. There's an increasing demand. And actually the health, sorry, the healthcare, but the uh, childcare industry is actually kind of going through some shifts right now. And because of those shifts, we look at the experience we have and say, we could actually really be helpful to these people. Yeah. Well, we've done a lot of daycares over the years. 100%. And and again, that's the nice thing about being a generalist is we've done a lot of every industry and every daycare we've done, it has gone well. And it has been been a good experience for us and we're good at it. That's one thing you can do if you're a generalist or if you've been in your space for long enough is just sit down and have have an honest discussion with yourself and say, not, not which ones do I like the most always, but like which one am I really good at? Can I offer a real solution for, definitely. you know? I think you should like them too, of course, but we love our daycares. Yeah, definitely. Well, and you guys asked me once I got back, mm-hmm. um, kind of my take, what my take was on it. And I think for me, it was an easy conversation of saying, yeah, let's go down this road. Because in a lot of cases, like you guys said, we understand how it's going and what the market's shifting towards. But also, we've had a lot of really good success with it because there's not a thousand different tools that you can use for for daycares uh, unless you're customizing and building your own. Um, And what I mean by that is that has allowed us to become very good at utilizing those platforms, really good at talking with our clients regarding class size requirements and, you know, all those different types of things there. And so all of that's really helped us to be able to provide good quality service to our customers, which we're excited to expand into. We have decided to do a little niching, but as the sales and marketing guy, this is where I start to get nervous because I have put 15 years into our website and created a very specific message. One, I don't feel like shaking all that up because it is, we've got some SEO work in there for us. We have, you know, 20 to 30,000 people visit our website every month. I don't want to mess with that, right? That's a helpful asset to have. I also don't want to go through and change thousands of pages and update them to, we're a daycare accounting firm now. So I think it's okay. There's, there seems to be some shame in the entrepreneur space to say you have to like you have to niche or you're not good at as an entrepreneur, right? Like you're you're screwing up if you're a generalist. I don't think that's the case. Being a generalist has served us really well. It's helped us build a really good business, and it's helped us learn what we're good at. But what we've decided to do is to create a separate brand called Accounting for Daycares that is going to be focused 100% on doing that. And it will be powered by Ignite Spot. So if you're looking at doing a niching strategy, I don't think you need to like throw everything at the craps table, yeah. right? I think you can keep your brand going and start a second website. And if you're really good at it, have your staff service those clients that come through that website. Well, and I think to add to that too is, you know, luckily with the size that we are as an organization, we have a a lot of resources in our company. We can transition and move clients around to so we can give 
direct service to people who have those types of skills. Not all of our employees have skills around daycares. Of course, Ryan and I do because we've been working with them for a really long time. But our bookkeepers and our accountants and our controllers don't all have experience in that space. And so for us to be able to niche, we want to provide good quality service. And so we'll have to make some shifts to be able to do that. But it gives us that option to be able to go down that road. And I think that's something just from an operational standpoint, when you start thinking about niching and moving down that space is, do I have the resources to be able to put into this? And not saying you have to have the whole system set up perfectly, but can I allocate enough time, energy and effort and education to dive into this space? Can Do I have the people on my team who can deliver high quality service for it? Because it's as not being a generalist, you have to make sure you're delivering at a higher level. There's an expectation from the customer because you are the expert to be able to deliver that higher level. And so make sure that you can. Yeah. What's your, what's your thought on that, Ryan? Shifting to daycares. Yeah. I, I think it's exciting. And to Dan's point, when we talk about us being generalists and then offering a niche offering, what that really means is we've got some staff who are going to have to be experts at daycare and they're going to have to be expert at daycare only. They're not going to get to play in our general pool anymore. They're going to have to know the softwares we like. They're going to be able to go in and recommend things that are actually going to help the daycare succeed. They're going to have to understand student to teacher ratios and how to make that work. They're going to have to understand food costs and how to actually make that an important part of their daily discussion with clients. They're going to have to understand tracking and marketing that actually works. They're going to have to understand compensation for teachers. They're going to have to understand a lot of different things that are very specific to daycare and they can't play in our general pool anymore. I grew up in a daycare, and when you mentioned food costs, it just reminded me of all those excellent meals I had (laughs) in the daycare. Oh, those were the good days. All right. Well, I'm I'm really excited about this, and I think you know if you're if you're trying to figure out a way to niche, something that that I really believe is that you don't have to like. There's this need for entrepreneurs to grow really fast. Okay, I'm doing this. I'm going. Let's go. We're climbing that mountain tomorrow. I think it's actually okay to like pick the summit. We're going there. There needs to be a very clear vision. But then I think it's okay to get 1% better every day. I don't think you need to invest $100,000 tomorrow, buy all of the tickets, buy all of the software, and just go all in and mortgage your house and you know trade your kid's college fund to figure this out. I think you can just decide over the next 24 to 36 months, I'm going to become the expert in this thing and we're going to be great at what we do. You know? I definitely agree with that because I think it's one of those those pieces that allows you to be able to, to get to the level of being the expert as much as you want to sell from the marketing and advertising space. Because I think that's the other part of it too is even with daycares, there's different types of daycares. Mm-hmm. And so that's something we want to make sure that we can have proof of consistency when we market to it. We don't want to just go out there and say, hey, we do all daycares and let's go through this. And, and now we're dealing with different types of daycares that have state funding specific regulations or are very in a saturated market or high in high rises or things of that nature, they're all very, very different. And so making sure that we support the right type of client and our team is educated in that space is something that's critical. But that being said too, Sometimes running fast is not a bad thing. No, I, um, I, I want to go as fast as we can. I'll point that out. I, I didn't say run as but, fast as you possibly can, but I said it's not a bad thing to run fast, Yeah. Um, especially if you have direction. I yeah. think that's part that helps you to be able to to still feel like that dream and that ed, that goal that you're working towards is going to be achieved. Just knowing a direction and not moving fast enough oftentimes can force you to change direction, Yeah. Um, which goes – usually means going back <laughs> to the generalist or the- uh, You get scared. 100%. Or it just doesn't become a priority anymore because you you haven't put enough energy and effort into to be able to get to that point you need. Yeah. So you're not seeing the return. Correct. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, anything else you want to say on niching before we wrap up the show today? I think you can't be afraid if you have an expertise to dip your toe in that water. Mm-hmm. And to the comments that were made earlier- Sometimes we feel like we have to be all or nothing in everything that we do. And as we've talked about today, we're finding ways to dip our toe into the water from a niching standpoint without losing the identity we've created over the last number of years that we've been doing this. So niching, I think, is a good thing. Don't be afraid of it. Agreed. 
don't be afraid just to dip your toe in that water and see how it feels. Yeah. Well, and I'd add to that, just the comment with that too, is if you are, if you're getting ready to start a business with it or, you know, kind of get it rolling instead of already having one like we are, and we're trying to make that transition, you have a little more control Mm. over that niched environment. You have a little more control because of the experience and expertise you've had from before. And so if you are opening a new business and you're looking at what options you're going, you can go into, maybe get a little bit more specific, maybe not too specific. I mean, and I, and I use this as the example of like a doctor that's a neurosurgeon, but only focuses on ear drainage in as neurosurgeon. I mean, that just seems really weird, but that may cause some limitations for you, but still be very specific in the direction you're going. Still feel feel like you have, you have good control and you can provide a good quality service, but don't be afraid to dive into it a little more deeper than just the surface level. I didn't know or didn't plan on the fact that we would be speaking about bodily fluid drainage on this show. So I yeah. really appreciate that. Right out the uh, ears. <laughs> so I, 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 if I were starting a new business today, I like that tip, Dan, like you kind of don't have nearly as much to lose. So it's not as scary, right? You can just like go specific and hit it hard. It is a little harder for guys like us who've been generalists for a long time, but we do have some advantages. We know what we're good at. We know what we're not good at. And we've done it. So we have a proven track record. I think there's a uh, reason to niche, like Ryan says, niching is a good idea. You should figure out how to do it so that you're more valuable, but do it in a way that makes sense for your situation, your finances, and so on, right? Very much so. Very good. All right. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode today, I want to thank you for watching. And if you're interested in all at having us be your accountants, we would love the honor to do that for you. The best way to do that is to go to ignitespot.com and you can click on pricing and see our four packages. But even before that, you should probably try us out to see if we actually know what we're talking about. So at the very top of our website, there is an offer to have a free 30-minute QuickBooks review. We assign one of our QuickBooks Pro certified accountants to your business, and they will dig in and show you everything that's working and give you some free tips. So until next week, thanks for watching, and we'll see you around. Mm -hmm.